Godsport, Gooseport or Gosport. No matter what the origin of the name, most of us simply know it as home. According to historians, the fact that Gosport has existed as a town goes back as far as 1241 AD, though the origin of the name will be discussed for many years to come. Now sit back and relax as we present Hidden Gosport, Looking from the Inside. My name is Pam Braddock, I work at Fort Brockhurst for English Heritage looking after the site and the collections here. This is one of the main stores at Fort Brockhurst and it contains archaeological, architectural and historic objects relating to English Heritage sites in Hampshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire um, with a few from Kent, some from the Isle of Wight and most of the stuff is really important and significant objects. So although they might look a fairly dull collection of things, um, in actual fact the stories associated with these collections are quite important. So the Porchester Castle collection for example is archaeological finds excavated over a period of about 15 years at Porchester Castle by a gentleman called Barry Cunliffe. Um, and it's one of the most important collections of a Roman uh, site in this country um, and this stuff isn't just sitting here unused and unloved it's here for a purpose and the purpose is that it's here to be cared for and to be researched forever and my job is to look after it okay a replica gun it's a copy of a gun at Pevensey Castle dating to about 1545 it's called a demi it's not used for anything, it was um, made for our events department to put a charge in and make lots of smoke. It looks good on picture. Walking up the southern gum ramp towards the ramparts, looking across the parade ground towards the casemates in the distance. From the ramparts, looking towards the centre Caponia with the main institute building on the right hand side. is one of the chimneys which will lead down into the casemates below. It goes through the earthwork, so through three, three metres of soil and through eight courses of bricks into a casemate. More along the ramparts, another expense magazine on the left where the ammunition would have been stored when the guns were firing just in case they got a, an enemy hit. Coming up a 64 pounder rifled muzzle loading Armstrong gun with a range of something like 1500 metres. Would have done a fair bit of damage on Brockhurst roundabout if anybody had ever been able to fire it. And a very large fake gun. This is not a real gun, this is a fiberglass gun that came from um, Spitbank Fort on a very small boat and caused a riot in the harbour. Okay, this is the keep taken from the parade ground. interior of the keep and the tunnel into the parade ground. 
Okay, this is the interior of the keep. It looks like the area at the base of the spiral staircase up to the top. This is a room that public don't generally go into. And this is the view that you first see when you get to the top of the keep at the top of the spiral staircase with lots of ivy. This is the most marvellous view from the top of the keep looking down into the centre. And this is one of the staircases that leads back down into the centre of the keep. This is the view from the other side of the grassed area with what is the bombed area and the commanding officer's quarters on the right hand side. Brilliant. Stokes Bay, with its popular beach, was a favourite amongst the locals. With views across the Solent to the Isle of Wight and Portsmouth, it is also home to one of our most vital resources. Let's take a closer look at the service and try to take it a little less for granted. My name is Mike Allen, I'm the Operational Vice Chairman for the Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service, or Gaffers as it's known within the service, and I'm also one of the uh, frontline lifeboat coxswains for the service. All of the volunteers at the Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service are unpaid volunteers. That's uh, the lifeboat crew, the shore crew and the fundraisers, and we're always looking to actively recruit uh, potential new shore crew, lifeboat crew and fundraisers for the organisation. The Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service is a declared facility to the HM Coast Guard. It's on call 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. That means that all of our volunteers can be called out at any moment. Normally the boat is on the water within 10 to 15 minutes of being paged, which makes it a very effective uh, SAR um, organisation. The Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service was formed in 1969 and it also forms part of the Solent Sea Rescue Organisation which was a Hampshire County Council initiative that took place in about 1985 um, to bring all of the independent lifeboats in the Solent under one umbrella organisation. Each organisation is autonomous in its um, running and the boats that it uses so they all run totally independently um, just with an umbrella organisation over, over the top of it. Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service on average ten, attends 120 calls a year. The last few years have been a bit quieter than normal, um, probably 90 to 100 calls. And uh, there for all sorts of incidents, be it breakdowns, mechanical breakdowns, uh, emergencies regarding medical emergencies, um, vessels on fire and vessels taking on water in the Solent area. It costs around about 50,000 a year to run the uh, Gosport and Ferrum Inter Rescue Service. That's without any uh, capital expenditure such as uh, new boats, um, 
and you know, major equipment. Uh, the money, a lot of the money, obviously fuel um, for the number of incidents we attend. All of the funding is done by um, a small fundraising team, and again, it's um, the, the service relies entirely on um, the public generosity in keeping the service running. Every penny of every pound goes towards running the service. Nobody takes any um, financial payment or receives a financial reward for their voluntary work. The newest lifeboat is a nine metre rigid inflatable with the inboard uh, diesel engines driving water jet units. This is a very you know, effective and safe means of uh, propulsion for the vessel. The Gosport and Fairmish Rescue Service operational area includes Portsmouth Harbour, the harbour entrance, out through the historic forts across to the Isle of Wight and then as far west as Titchfield Haven. Gaffers is an independent uh, lifeboat which means effectively that it uh, receives no funding from the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, RNLI. Um, we, we work closely with the RNLI and the Coast Guard helicopter, but obviously we receive no uh, financial sort of backing from them whatsoever. Gaffers is quite unique in that it mans a station at weekends, bank holidays and uh, high risk events such as uh, Cow's Week. That means that a crew is on station at immediate notice from 9.30 in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. The benefits of this are that uh, if the Coast Guard requires the lifeboat, the lifeboat can be in the on the water within minutes of uh, the request from the Coast Guard. On duty days, the lifeboat station doors are always open to the public that might be passing by. However, each year we do hold a blue light and lifeboat open day. On this uh, occasion, we invite emergency services such as the police, fire, ambulance, bomb disposal, MOD, police, and a whole host of other emergency services uh, and they attend our open day so that members of the public can get to meet a lot of the blue light services at one event. From above the water, we now travel below the surface. Let's join John in the Dive Museum where he is waiting to explain the rich history of diving and Gosport's role within that history. Hello, I'm Dr John Bevan. Uh, I'm the Chairman of the Historical Diving Society and I help to run the Diving Museum here in Gosport. We've got different sections. We've got recreational diving, historic diving, Royal Navy and military diving and commercial diving and also in another extension we have some claims to fame of Gosport in diving. Surprisingly the inventor of the diving helmet actually lived in Gosport and this is where diving actually started back in the early 1800s. It spread from there into the forces, into the Royal Navy, into the Royal Engineers. That took the facilities and capabilities around the whole world and of course commercial diving came out of that. Well, what we've got here is an atmospheric diving suit. It can go to a depth of a thousand feet or 300 meters in the sea. The man inside is at atmospheric pressure, so he's not exposed to the sea pressure at all, not like a diver. The divers, on the other hand, are exposed to the pressure, and when they go down, they have to decompress slowly when they come back up to the surface. These are very special Royal Navy divers. Their equipment is designed to be non-magnetic and silent. And this is because the mines that they are uh, recovering or dismantling underwater can be set off by sound or by magnetism. So they don't want to set it off by their presence. It starts off with early equipment here from the 1960s through to modern computerized breathing equipment here. Over there we've got some very old equipment from the Second World War. These suits were called clammy death and they were used by charioteers, the divers that uh, rode the uh, underwater torpedoes or man torpedoes. And this is our section on historical diving equipment. Uh, this is what's called standard diving equipment and it lasted for about 150 years. In fact, when it was first invented in 1829, it looked virtually exactly the same. It was perfected at that time, it's extremely simple and very safe and very robust. 
The diver's helmet is made of copper and brass and is connected to the suit by a flange. So the diver inside is completely dry. He gets his air from the surface down an umbilical and it free flows through the helmet. He can control the flow with an exhaust valve on the side of the helmet itself. He has to wear quite a lot of weight in order to sink himself. These suits and helmets contain a large volume of air and in order to be able to sink they have to wear a large weight on the front and a large weight on the back. This for example is a 40 pound weight on, that he would wear on his front and there'd be a similar weight on his back. His boots each weigh 20 pounds each and his helmet about 45 pounds. So he's got quite a lot of weight to make him sink in the water. Out of the water of course he's very cumbersome but once he's in the water all that weight is lifted off him by the buoyancy of the suit. Now there's a very special model inside this case. This came from C.B. Gorman Museum uh, who were the inventors uh, and manufacturers of much of the diving equipment you see here today. What's very special is this model here. It consists of a chamber and a diving bell attached to the top of the chamber. This means that the divers inside the bell can transfer while still under pressure into the chamber. So when they come back from their dive, rather than having to stay inside the bell for many hours, maybe 10 hours, to decompress, they can lock their chamber, their bell, onto the chamber, transfer into the chamber and spend the rest of the decompression in the luxury of the uh, deck compression chamber. Now we come to sport diving. When I first started diving, this is the sort of equipment I was wearing. I had homemade weight, homemade weight belts, homemade lines for the boy on the surface, homemade wetsuit, and what's called an ABLJ, or adjustable buoyancy life jacket, and a twin hose demand valve. That changed over the years, and now we come to state-of-the-art recreational diving equipment here. Single hose demand valve, rather nicely designed wetsuit, and professionally made boy lines, etc and uh, very comprehensive instrumentation. So we have compasses, a depth gauge and a contents gauge for the cylinder on the back. And as you can see the diver is looking quite smart and very much a lot of design goes into making the equipment look very smart these days. This is a very interesting little corner for me because this is a game of underwater hockey that I used to play. I used to be captain of the team in South Sea. South Sea is very important with this game because that's where the game was actually invented back in 1954. The game has become so popular now that it's played all over the world and there are major international championships held in places like Australia, Canada and all over Europe. The divers wear mask, fins and snorkel and they push a puck around the bottom of the pool using a pusher and they have to score by pushing the puck into a gully each end. It's a breath hold game, so all the time they're playing, they're holding the breath. You have to be fit playing this game. The proper name for the game is Octopush, that's what it was called originally. Although today many people refer to it as underwater hockey. So, this is the diving museum at Stokes Bay in Gosford. We're a charity, we're run by volunteers. And we open between April and October on weekends and bank holidays from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. Everybody is welcome and we can open for special groups anytime. Built in 1762, the Royal Hospital Hasla was originally commissioned as a military establishment for the Royal Navy. Now let's cross over to Mark where he walks us around the site and gives an in-depth account of the history and the people that were based within its walls. Hello. Welcome to the Royal Hospital Hasler. I'm Mark Trasler and I'm a member of Hasler Heritage Group and complete with my colleagues we're looking after the site and after the, ho the hospital's closed until it's uh, next but inca it's next incarnation. Today we're, we're going to be wandering around the grounds of this magnificent building and site 
and I'm just going to give you an introduction but to the history, the long hit per, per history of the Royal Hospital Hazlitt. This is the purpose-built pathology laboratory, built in 1899. It is the only building on the site which is built at an angle. 1899 was one of the uh, pioneering days of pathology and, and this is probably one of the first in first purpose-built pathology laboratories in the country. It's built at an angle and with these large wide windows in order to uh, in order to get the maximum amount of sunlight. The reason being that in the old days of course all the, all the microscopes had a little mirror but underneath the slide to, uh, to reflect the light up the lens and by building this this building on a north-south axis allowed them to, uh, to get the maximum hours of sunlight during the day. Well, welcome to the magnificent building of Hasler Hospital. The foundations were laid in 1746 and the hospital first opened to, to patients in 1752. When it was finished in 1762, it was the largest brick building in, in Europe and twice as big as the London hospitals of the day. The hospital was designed by Theodore Jacobson in the manner of the founding the hospital and building was under the direction of James Horn, a surveyor, and John Turner who was a master carpenter from Portsmouth Dockyard just the other side of the water. But the original budget was £30,000 but in the way of these things by the time that it was finished, they'd spent £181,000. The Royal Navy had, lot, had during the Georgian period and during the uh, 18th century, a real shortage of manpower. They were fighting lots of wars all over the world. There were many uh, diseases, ailments, and of course men of war were, uh, were a very dangerous place to live and work. Give us a wave Philip. <laughs> my good side? <laughs> I don't have one. This Georgian house here is one of the 15 Georgian properties but in the hospital grounds. This house was used as the residence of the medical officer in charge and was his official living accommodation. One of its past residences, a residence was James Lind who became the physician in charge at Hasler for 25 years taking over in 1758. James Lind is quite a remarkable person he conducted the first ever clinical trial. During the 18th century and before, of course, scurvy, the lack of vitamin C, as caused by the lack of vitamin C, was a real scourge of navies around the world. What he did was he had an outbreak of scurvy and he 
chose 12 patients, splitting them up into six groups. The first group he fed two pints of cider to a day. The second group had six spoonfuls of vinegar a day. Third group had barley water and spicy paste. The fourth, rather unlucky group, had to drink half a pint of seawater a day. Fifth group had two oranges and one lemon burger to eat. And the sixth, probably even more unlucky group, had something called elixir of vitriol, which is a dilute, so a dilute for solution of sulfuric acid. 25 drops of that to drink a day. Of course, the two oranges, the group that was on two oranges and one lemon was the group which recovered from scurvy and, and admittedly a fair few years later the Admiralty officially recognised this, started issuing limes, and later on lemons, covered to the fleet and cured the scrounge of scurvy. These are the original railway lines in here from which patients from the dockyard, well, from Portsmouth Harbour, came up in three purpose-made Birmingham-built ambulance for the, for the carriages and they were wheeled up to a hospital along these railway lines. This house, to the right here, used to be occupied by, by Sir John Richardson. And Sir John Richardson entered the Navy in 1807 as an assistant for a surgeon. And in 1819, that he was appointed the doctor to Sir John Franklin's Arctic expedition. He joined Hasler in 1838 and was promoted inspector of hospitals in 1840. Whilst at Hasler he carried out many reforms and, and when the British government mounted an expedition to find out what had happened to Sir John Franklin uh, who was trying to find the North West Passage across the top of Canada because, because he just uh, disappeared they mounted an, an expedition, an overland search to go and find him and Sir John Richardson was appointed to lead that expedition. These are the stables where Sir John Richardson used to keep his gig and horse for, uh, for pulling it. Welcome to St Luke's Church at Hasler, built as the hospital chapel in 1762. It's a lovely Georgian building which is still regularly in use. We have uh, monthly services here 
every fourth Sunday, and it's used regularly for um, occasions such as baptisms and funerals. The Red Cross flag is, is one which was flown on board His Majesty's hospital ship Vita. The Vita was a hospital ship during both the First and Second World Wars and the flag has actually got uh, some shrapnel holes in it from when the Vita, full of patients, was attacked as it left to Brook, evacuating the casualties from the 8th Army and it was attacked by German dive bomb, other bombers and disabled. The stained glass windows at the front of the church were both erected as memorials to the uh, many patients who died, what? who died in the hospital. This one, uh, interestingly, was erected in 1911, i.e. predating the First World War. The one on the opposite side, showing Jesus preaching on the uh, Sea of Galilee, was erected in 1916. Broadcasting 24 hours a day throughout the War Memorial Hospital, Radio Hasler provides an invaluable service to the hospital. Paul is waiting to give us a more informative description of the station, so let's join him now in the Green Room. Hiya, my name's Paul Dodd and I'm the current chairman of Radio Hasler. Um, I say the current chairman, there's only been three of us, um, Chris Pierce, Keith Fossey and then myself, I'm the shortest in time. Um, chairman, having this is my third year, um, I've got two more to catch up on Keith. Um, the station has been on air since ooh, 10th of March 1993. We started um, way back then. In fact, it was started by a young lad called Chris Pierce. Him and a couple of his friends got together in a McDonald's. They were doing um, hospital radio over at the QA hospital in Portsmouth and decided that actually there was a need for it in in Gosport with us having the biggest military hospital um, in Britain uh, and perhaps we should bring something like that to them. So he sat down with a couple of his friends in McDonald's in the high street and formulated Radio Hasler um, at the tender age of 16, bless him, um, and then a couple of years later it got launched from um, what was Fort, well, what was Dolphin, now Fort Blockhouse, they had a little cottage in there that they uh, transmitted into um, Hasler Hospital. When Hasler shut down at the beginning of this century, we had to move um, and having had a look at a few places, we found that Thorngate Halls provided uh, adequate, well I'd say adequate, yeah I'd like to say adequate premises, but actually they've been superb. Um, they've bent over backwards to help us, they've given us far more room than we th ever thought we would get. We've now got two studios. We've got this beautiful green room. Um, and I'll tell you where we came about this in a minute. Um, and basically we took over the premises from Gosport Voluntary Action when they moved down to Martin Snape House. So that's how we started. Um, Chris moved, moved out of here about three years ago and asked me to take on as station director. I've been here, ooh, 
16, yeah, about 16 years now. In fact, my first show was with Chris Pierce. Um, when I was doing what I did with you, actually, Mark, when you came on and, and learnt with me, um, I did with Chris 16 years ago. So we did this, then I started presenting. I, I did all the request shows on a Monday, then I went to a Tuesday. And I wanted to get away from Mondays because every bank holiday, I was always working. Um, so then we went to Tuesdays, then we went to Fridays, and then I left requests for a couple of months and then came back and now I do Thursdays. I've been doing Thursdays, ooh, about seven years now. Uh, not long before Asla shut down, about four or five years, we'd started um, broadcasting to the War Memorial uh, Hospital, which, if people don't know, is... It's, it, it's not only for, for patients recovering, but it has a speciality for brain injuries um, or head injuries. And of course, brain injuries encounter strokes, uh, all sorts of mental illness as well. Um, and there's, there's a great need there because the, unlike, well, now actually it's similar to Hasler, the patients in Hasler, some of the service patients had few visitors. They, they didn't live around this area, so the families weren't from this area, so they didn't get visitors. And it's the same with the War, War Memorial, really. A lot of their um, patients are elderly, they, you know, certainly post, post 60. Um, their own children have, have moved away. Um, we find invariably that most of their partners uh, have already passed on. Uh, and they're, they're here very much as a single patients uh, with, with little visitors. So what does Radio Asla do? Well our mission actually um, is to bring comfort to the sick uh, and so then we have three request shows a, a week and what we do is we walk around the wards and we talk to every single patient. Now some of them haven't got, haven't got uh, any interest in music whatsoever some of them haven't got any interest in anything at all. You know, um, little infomercials, you know, things about gas detectors and things like that that we put out on air. The firemen are happy to go around and, and, and talk to people. We have them in occasionally. All sorts of groups. If you're of an interest to the, to the community, then we'll, that, that's where we're at. You know, we'll, we'll advertise you, we'll bring you out and let the that's community nice. know about you. I'm nearly 60. I bounce around them fields like there's no tomorrow. Um, my little techie has brought me a stool, one of these pop-up stools, because I am disabled, I've got two duff knees and, 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 and a dodgy back. Um, and, and while I say I leap around the fields, it's probably one jump from one side of the marquee to another. Um, but as I go around the various stools, he's got the chair behind me, so as soon as I've finished interviewing, I'm sat on the chair, because I'm shattered. Um, but yeah, we get round it. For We now cross over to the Coastal Forces Heritage Trust, where Rupert is waiting to show us around the old gunboat yard situated in the grounds of Kinetic. Uh, my name is Rupert Head. I'm a com retired commander from the Royal Navy, and I now work as the project director for the Coastal Forces Heritage Trust, uh, which is based uh, in Portsmouth. And we are affiliated with the National Museum of the, of the Royal Navy. I'm now standing in front of part of the old Hasler gunboat yards. Uh, these were built in the mid 1800s by Lord Palmerston as part of his grand plan to uh, build up the defences of the south coast of Britain. Uh, these buildings um, were erected in 1855-1856 and at the time they were built, built were the height of advanced technology. The boats uh, would come up Hasler Creek, they would go onto cradles and they'd be hauled up the slipway and then transversed and slotted into one of the yards behind me where they would be uh, maintained and repaired. Um, the gunboat yards were uh, interesting at the time. Nothing had been designed or built like them before. Um, the, th there is a thought, uh, it's not proven, that Isambard Kingdom Brunel had a hand in the design. 
what we can be certain of is that in 1851 a model of these gunboat yards was taken to the the grand exhibition in in London because as I said a moment ago they were considered very advanced engineering technology at the time. I'm now standing in one of the old gunboat yards, one of the bays, and if we could put the clock back uh, 60 years, um, we would find that this space would be full of uh, coastal motor boats, motor torpedo boats, motor launches. Um, they would be pulled up here uh, on cradles along the rails and the, the crews, the engineering crews, support crews, would work on the boats. Uh, this, uh, this building was used continuously throughout both world wars. Uh, the advantage, of course, of using these gunboat yards was that the boats could be uh, repaired and maintained um, undercover. Uh, and they could get boats of about 160 tons into these gunboat yards. And what is extraordinary is that this facility was still in use right up until 1978. I'm now at the back of the uh, gunboat yard, um, which of course is now empty, derelict and looking very sad. But the construction, all this ironwork around, um, was built to last. It is now um, about 180 years old and is in really very good condition. What will happen to the gunboat yards, none of us know, but it is a building of great historic importance, particularly within the context of the history of the Royal Navy. Um, it would be nice if these, these buildings were used and preserved. At one time, this was a vital facility, um, particularly in wartime, to maintain our forces, our coastal forces, motor torpedo boats, motor launches, and uh, motor gunboats. The, the boats, motor gunboats, motor torpedo boats, would come up Hasler Creek um, and they would be uh, pulled up onto a cradle, uh, which would be semi-submerged on the slipway, and the cradle, cradle with the boat on top would be hauled up the slipway and then it would be transversed along rails by um, an extraordinary piece of equipment called the elephant. And the elephant was able to transverse the boats at right angles to the, the gunboat yard and the water. So the boat was then opposite uh, the, the bay where it was going to go into. Once in that position, the boat would then be hauled up the rest of its journey uh, into this building here uh, the process was, was uh, done very efficiently and very quickly. The sooner they could get the boats under cover and start working on them, particularly in wartime, the better. Um, I'm now standing in front of Hasler Creek. Behind me is the water. The boats would have been uh, come up the creek and they would have gone onto a, a cradle which would have run along the, the rails behind me in the ground there would have been a slipway which would have gone down from the level I'm standing on now down to the water and at all parts of the tide, high and low water, they would have been able to put the boats on the cradles and haul them up to where I'm standing here. At that point the cradle would have been swung left or right, right angles to the, the creek, um, opposite the, the bay in the gunboat yard which would then have uh, have taken the boat. The, the boats were transversed uh, using an extraordinary uh, piece of engineering called an elephant which was steam driven and which would move the cradles uh, left and right to get the boats in the right place to go into the gunboat yard. I'm now standing um, on the waterfront at the Hornet Sailing Club um, but back in the 1950s, I would have been in HMS Hornet, which was the last coastal forces based uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, where we can now see Hasler Marina, um, all the private uh, owned uh, yachts, 
this would have been full of uh, most torpedo boats and uh, they would have used this as the main base uh, for the Royal Navy. The, the boats would be moored out on pontoons here and where I am now would have been HMS Hornet. Um, behind me, to my left, is, is the wardroom and all the other buildings would be part of HMS Hornet, the uh, Coastal Forces base. This here is a, a record of all the uh, Coastal Forces bases um, which uh, were commissioned during the Second World War, mainly around the south coast of the country, in all these places here, um, in Lowestoft, Hastings, Dover, Portland, Dartmouth and other places, Coastal Forces bases um, were grew up because we needed to have um, bases on the coast from where the, the most torpedo boats could go out and take the war to the enemy. And this is a list of the major bases. There were more than this and we had bases also in the Mediterranean, Indian Ocean um, and uh, latterly along the north coast of Europe as well as, as after D-Day. Every year um, in November, Sunday nearest the 11th of November, we have a remembrance service here to uh, mark the many thousands of naval personnel who served in coastal forces. By 1945 we had over 30,000 personnel, officers and ratings serving in coastal forces. And Hornet, which is where we are now, was the very last base to close. It was the headquarters base for coastal forces and it was decommissioned formally in the uh, in 1950s, mid-1950s. And is now a sailing club. Uh, it was Adventurous Training uh, Sailing Centre for the three services. Um, but this is where, for coastal forces, a lot of the history of coastal forces was, was made. And it was from this base that the MTBs and the motor gunboats went out into the channel and um, went out onto operations. And of course, sadly, some of those boats uh, didn't come back again. Um, this board here gives a very quick uh, overbrief of what Hornet would have looked like um, at the latter stages of the war. Um, this is now a marina, but of course in those, in those times it was full of motor torpedo boats, um, motor gunboats um, going in and out of harbour. Great deal of activity here. Um, several hundred naval personnel was based here in, in Hornet. Um, and it was a base here until it closed in 1955. Completed in 1911, Steve Pinnis 199 was one of 634 such vessels built for the Royal Navy. He was one of the two vessels allocated to and carried aboard HMS Monarch as a guard ship. We are now joined by Martin, where he describes some of the much-needed restoration and refit. I'm Martin Marks. I'm one of the volunteers of Group 199, who uh, maintain, manage and operate Steam Pinnace 199. My roles in the organisation include being the Deputy Coxswain, editing our monthly e-newsletter, membership and public relations. Steam Pinnace 199 is owned by the National Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. She was built in 1911 and was designed to be carried on a battleship of the period and would provide a cover for the battleship when it was anchored in an unprotected harbour. Uh, in that role she was known as a picket boat and she'd be similar to the uh, police boats that we see around Portsmouth Harbour today protecting the warships. She's 50 feet long and uh, had a, she's got a steam engine and boiler which we'll hear more about later and she was armed with a three-pounder Hotchkiss gun. 
She's been in this shed in Gosport and we're just behind St Vincent College in what used to be the drying room and laundry for the old HMS St Vincent when it was a, a boys and uh, ratings training establishment for the Royal Navy. She's been in here now for two years and a few months uh, undergoing what we've uh, called a hundred year refit. We've put in something like 10,000 volunteer hours into the refit and the hull is now all but finished. We are just waiting for the boiler to come back from the Isle of Wight where it's having to be professionally retubed some work that we decided was beyond the uh, resources of our volunteer engineers. The, the refit work has included a considerable amount of work on the hull in, including replacing a large se segment of the keel. The deck which is teak has been uh, stripped out and all the corking removed and replaced and she's had a complete paint job throughout. The engine, which is still in the workshop here, has had a minimal amount of work done on it, which is something of a compliment considering the engine was built in about 1920. It's not the original engine for the boat, but it is of the original pattern. The boiler is, is, is not the type of boiler that was used in this boat. It's one of several boilers submitted to the, M, to the MOD, or Admiralty as it was called then, as a, a possible candidate for this class of boats. This particular boiler was rejected at the time and uh, was used in the dockyard to power a laundry for a number of years. But uh, when they came to restore this boat in the 70s, it was the only uh, boiler of that period that they could get their hands on, hence it's being used. We, we're very grateful to the support that we've had financially, uh, particularly from the Heritage Lottery Trust and the Friends of the Museum and about 10 or 15 other organisations and individuals who've either given us money or cash in kind. In particular, International Paints have provided all the paint for the refit and have also given us a lot of technical help in choosing the, the best paints and the preparation and methods of application. This is Steam Pinnace 199's main engine. It was built by Mumford's in Colchester and uh, during its day it would deliver about uh, 162 horsepower at 620 revs, giving the Steam Pinnace a top speed of about 14 knots. You can see through this sump door the uh, internal workings of the engine and considering it's a hundred years old it's a beautiful piece of engineering and we've had to do almost nothing to it during the refit just rub in one of the steam valves which was making a slight slapping noise. Hello my name is Alastair Dilley I'm one of three trustees uh, charged with uh, looking after the moorings here and the boatyard of the maritime workshop. We have needed to uh, improve quite a lot of the facilities in the yard. Uh, we've uh, included mains, water, electricity to the pontoons and we've now included uh, CCTV within the boatyard and uh, we've just finished automating the gates so, so that the gates are self-locking. An interesting part of the history with the yard is the fact that it, it was here where the uh, cutter was built that Captain Bly was set, a, set adrift in uh, during the mutiny on the Bounty. My earlier life was in the Royal Navy as Marine Engineer Artificer. Um, from there my, my second career was with the Royal National Lifeboat Institute as an uh, engineer surveyor. Both jobs brought a lot of skills into working with 199. Most of our materials on board are really old, uh, obviously convert, uh, consistent with the age of the vessel. A lot of it machinery wise has to be done by hand, uh, fitting and turning, uh, the ship writing, all done by hand. I've got uh, a set of volunteers as an ex-Royal Navy shipwright uh, control electrical artificer, a marine engineer artificer and a marine engineer from customs cutters. Um, between us we keep the boat together and uh, take care of the maintenance and crewing. The majority of the work done during the refit uh, has involved a lot of skills. The boiler has been removed, uh, sent to a boiler maker for complete retubing, 860 tubes a um, lot of work and a very small boiler, very detailed skilled work. Uh, we're looking forward to getting her back and into the boat. Uh, the engine, I've had uh, 
stripped out the bottom end, inspected, measured all clearances, recorded them. Uh, the auxiliary pumps on board uh, have undergone similar work, uh, stripped, etc. Uh, the funnel here, good old funnel, down underneath this blue paint it's complete brass. Uh, so we've chose to keep the outer casing blue with the top band brass. Steering gear, very basic, uh, a hanging rudder, balanced, driven by uh, pulley wheels and wire uh, that's been inspected. Um, the stock was reworked back into its proper orientation because it was bent. Um, every time the wheel was put over there was a, a large clunk but that's been uh, taken away now. Uh, machinery, uh, the, the structure it sits on has been reworked. Uh, we've taken out a lot of old wood and replaced it with metal rafts, uh, which will dissipate the weight evenly and pull the hull together uh, when she's afloat. In 1947, Gosport Community Association was created by members attending Privet Secondary School. In 1957, they brought Berry House, and thus was born the continuing success of the Thorngate Halls. Hello, welcome to Thorngate Halls Gosport. Thorngate Halls is the home of the Gosport Community Association. It's run by members, for members, and for the benefit of Gosport Community. Gosport Community Association first started out in 1947, and it was started by a band of youths, really, from Privet Secondary School. The association welcomes all members of the community, regardless of colour, race, creed, nationality, religion, or any other differences you can think of. We like to welcome everybody and make our prices low to join to ensure that all members of the community can afford to, to use the facilities. The control of Gosport Community Association is vested in the Board of Trustees and Directors who are the governing body of the charity. We're elected annually at the annual general meeting and the function is to determine the general policy of the association. At the moment we're in our beautiful ballroom, it's recently been refurbished, offers superb cuisine and fully licensed bars. As we walk through the centre you'll begin to see the vastness of the property. We're just walking towards our Thorngate Theatre. The theatre an, is an asset beyond measure, licensed to seat 238 people. The theatre is equipped to fulfil even the most demanding company in their production of drama, comedy or musical performance, complete with stage licence, orchestra pit, dressing rooms and a cavernous stage. The facilities are such that even the most demanding of actors would be happy here. We have a licensed bar and the theatre will comfortably hold up to 150 people for private parties. In the near future, we are having help from Fairham Technical College. Their grade three painter and decorators are gonna come and decorate for us in period painting. So the colors will then suit the period of our beautiful theater. We're now walking towards the Cullen Suite. It was formerly called the Georgian Suite. This attractive room was previously used as the members' lounge bar and has been converted to allow it to be used in conjunction with the music room. Their combined use will make a good venue for small receptions, parties and social evenings, accommodating up to 70 people. Again, as you can see, we're badly in need of redecoration and unfortunately, being a standalone charity, we have to fund ourselves. We do get help from Gosport County Council sometimes, and also from Hampshire Council. 
However, that's not regular payment, so we have to fundraise, apply for grants such as the lottery funding, um, and we are doing this as, as quickly as we can when we can. Recently though, we've been extremely lucky. We applied for a grant from Hampshire County Council to refurbish the whole of the Georgian suite and the whole of our Georgian house, which you'll see soon. We're now walking into the bistro. The bistro is run by Hampshire Catering Services. They're a franchise catering company who provide a cafe facility in Berry House with an excellent choice of menu at reasonable prices. A comprehensive range of menus for private functions tailored to the individual's needs is also available. As I mentioned earlier, in 1947 the Gosport Community Association was started by a group of enthusiastic people who attended private secondary school. It continued there for about 10 years. In 1957, Berry House, a Georgian townhouse with extensive grounds and owned by the Hospital Management Board, was bought by the association. Since that date, the association has grown rapidly and currently is used by diverse cross section of the residents of Gosport and its surrounds for classes, clubs and private hire. The development of the centre continues. As I mentioned, we are dependent on our great staff, our volunteer trustees, and more importantly, the volunteers who give up time and effort every day of the week to help us continue. So here we are going into the members bar. That's the Agnew Lounge. The Agnew Lounge is specifically for members. There's two types of membership for joining the Gosport Community Association. One is for the association alone, and secondly, you can join to become a part of the social club. Rates are very low, so that everyone can join in. There's lots of benefits, entertainment, subsidised parties, and of course, the alcohol is at very reduced rates. The success of the association has been very much dependent not only on the trustees and our great staff, but also on the services of volunteers who put in many hours of work without reward, but with the satisfaction of knowing their help in their association. Without this band of people, the association would not be able to function as it does. Assistance is vital in all areas for maintenance and renovation there is much work to be done to bring the centre up to date. The association has little resources to meet the cost of contractors to carry out the work and is endeavouring to put together a directory of volunteers with the relevant skills. If you think you can help, please contact us. And so to end our journey through Gosport's rich and diverse community, we take a gentle stroll through a 17th century village set in the heart of Rauna. We now say hello to Little Wooden and goodbye to our modern existence. In 1642, the King of England, Charles Stuart, stood on the brink of civil war. Charles believed in the divine right of kings and sought to govern according to his own belief. Many of his subjects resented his levy of taxes without the consent of Parliament. He went on to marry a Roman Catholic, causing much mistrust amongst reformed groups such as the Puritans, who thought his views too Catholic. He fought the armies of both the English and the Scottish Parliament, and after his defeat in 1645, he surrendered to the Scots who in turn handed him back to the English. Imprisoned on the Isle of Wight, Charles formed an alliance with Scotland. At the end of 1648, Oliver Cromwell's army had consolidated its control over England. Charles was tried, convicted and in January 1649 executed for treason. 
The monarchy was then abolished and a republic called the Commonwealth of England was declared. With its slow pace of life, quaint little streets and isolated buildings, Little Woodham gives you the chance to explore and investigate at your leisure. It seeks to encourage you to generate your own discussion and questions and with the assistance of the villagers, hopefully you'll have some of those questions answered. With its authentic atmosphere, the residents dress in period attire, your visit leaves you wondering whether life was easier then or with the technology overload of today. 